coffee break. Um, so just to reiterate, you're in the transcribers to the archive session. Um, some of you might be interested in the future of transcribers, what's going to happen after the end of the read project, how the co-op works, what fees have to be paid, how the voting might work. If you want to talk about all those things, just go one floor down and one to the other. But today we're in Transcribers in the Archive. We're going to um, have uh, four presentations from people working in different archives, working um, with large-scale digitised documents with transcribers. And first up we have um, Tobias Hodel from the State Archives of Zurich. So please, thanks also for setting up this uh, great conference. It's mostly you did all the work. I'm from the State Archives of Zurich, as mentioned, and I'm going to talk about how we are involved in READ. So basically what our goals are, what, uh, in what direction we are working, and with what uh, documents. I called it large and small scale, due to the fact that we decided that we have one larger project that we are pursuing, and there are several smaller ones uh, that we are uh, occupied with as well, and it makes sense to see how the different trajectories uh, are, are going. It all started out about 15 years ago when we started a large project at the State Archives uh, in which 150,000 pages of uh, minutes of the executives have been transcribed. These are all documents from the 19th century. They span more or less the whole century. They are in German current, so most of the students and most of the people of the day are not really able to read it, so it's really sought after that you will get a straight transcription of the documents. The documents are mainly about uh, the dealing of the, of the executive in the capital of Zurich. So what we had at the beginning were this uh, more than 150,000 pages in Word documents, which we then transformed to TI-XML, and from there, with the help of the University of Rostock, of the SIT lab, we applied the text to an image tool that we presented here last year and we had uh, quite a success by aligning all the, the lines uh, within transcribers. So the layout and the lines work pretty well and the alignment of the lines with the, the transcribed words was quite a success. We negatively estimated it that it's at least 90% of all of the lines that have been aligned correctly. Those documents are now ready for training in HDR. We already trained some smaller models, but the whole bunch, and this is the idea, the, like the, the end goal, that we will trans <coughs> we will build a model upon 150,000 pages. So basically, build the largest HDR model available. We did not do this due to the fact that HDR Plus is will be available soon and. Due to the fact that training 150,000 pages will take quite an amount of time, so this will not be carried out in the, in the graphic user interface, but on a separate computer, probably in Innsbruck. From this one first 150,000 pages, we would like to go and recognize another 150,000 pages, uh, not on the, the level of the canton, or lack of the second level, but on the highest level. Uh, so we approached the Swiss National Archives and together with them we are preparing a project to recognize all of their minutes. The, the Federation, the Swiss Federation, has been founded in uh, 1884 and until 1903 all the executive minutes have been written down by hand. So these are again 150,000 pages we would like to recognize. Layout analysis will work, this is tested out, HDR is sufficient, but the ratio of loss will even reach a better quality. The goals are uh, that we will make the document searchable and probably do text extraction so that we can provide the text to the users who, who will do some text mining or apply whatever they want to do. HDR plus in that regard is a game changer. The model based on one 800 pages, so quite a small model, uh, spread over the centuries, over every year, basically 10 pages, resulted in a CR of around 7%. That's only with the uh, 800 pages. We're still curious what the 150,000 pages will look. Um, if we apply this model built for the minutes in, in Zurich on the, the document of the National Archive, we get a CR that is slightly higher, something around 9%. 
still the hope is that with more ground truth we will we'll get the results uh, down. But that means that the German current can be recognized without caring if the same scribe has been part of the training set. So there is the possibility that we can build general <coughs> models. That means with HDR Plus we have the hammer that nails it down for, for more or less everything. But it goes even beyond. Some days ago I received the model from Passau that was trained by Eva, about 1,100 pages, and I, I applied it on the documents. The result is, is also already quite good. And the documents in Passau, which are birth registers, Eva will talk about it uh, in a minute, uh, are completely different, but they are also in German correct. And the result is quite astounding. So we can say this problem of recognizing a term for end is basically solved. So we're in the same ballpark as with OCR for Gothic scripts, printed scripts, for example. That means until the end of the read project, we will be able to provide a model for German parent. We're currently assembling documents for Gothic handwriting that's 13th to 16th century, and I'm pretty optimistic that the results will be uh, similar. The HDR model here gives us uh, something around uh, CR of 10% for, for documents not part of the training set, um, and like in the long run, within the next five years or so, I'm uh, thinking that we will be able to recognize charges of the 12th century and basically everything there is enough ground truth. All thanks to HDR Plus and Gundra would like to introduce you to HDR Plus this afternoon. This was the, 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 the big scale. On small scale, we started applying uh, transcribers and uh, HDR recognition. Basically, with the goal to do uh, keyword spotting. Keyword spotting will be subject for, from a technical and from a, a content uh, perspective tomorrow. We use it for the guest of charges that have been produced handwritten in the 19th century, index of letters also from the 19th century, older title, finding aids, mostly also from the 19th, but also from the 18th century. And even with not perfectly suitable HDR models, uh, you are able to search it via KBS, via keyword, keyword spotting, and the results are so good that we use them internally. So if from the outside somebody approaches us and says, uh, I'm interested in, for example, this uh, retest of charges, but I'm not interested in, uh, and I don't know what time span I'm really interested in, but for example, in places uh, we can use the key, key, keyword spotting to give them an idea on which document they will be able to find something. Okay, keyword spotting even works on totally problematic documents. So you can see here a very old scan, probably from the 70s, it's from the State Archives of Bern, which is a state type project I'm uh, working with, and they provided us with, um, I think, some thousand pages of um, registers from birth, from deaths, and from marriages. We don't have suitable HDR models at all, as you can see below. Hopefully, we have seen better results from transcribers, but nonetheless, it is possible by using the keyword spotting to find the spots. Of course, you need some more time to go through all the, the false positives, but we have a rate calculated and estimated of around 95% of all instances that are going to be found even with this bad HDR result. Thanks a lot. Thanks very much, Tobias. Um, does anyone have any questions? Yeah. Um, just for a point, um, can you provide the TQI slide? Which one? You mentioned the TQI. Um, ah, yeah. Right at the beginning. Yeah. What, what do you say the URL? Sorry? The URL? Uh, the University of Rostock. That's ah, a simple. Yeah. Sorry, read uh, really likes its abbreviations, not only in the text but also <laughs> on paper. So that's the University of the Sit Lab of the University of Rostock. So the TTI was uh, prepared and implemented by Gundram. By okay, can you say a little bit about what the ground truth looked like outside? Um... Yeah. The, the initial ground truth uh, have been word documents. 
so transcribed by students. And what the only thing what we did to prepare it was to transform it to, to TIXML. And from there, the, the TIXML, the TXT files have been uh, provided. So if you would like to work with uh, the T2I, the text to image tool, what you usually need is text, one text file per page. And then the alignment process can even be started in the, the, the expert interface. Any other questions? Yeah. What is your progress with the abbreviations in all documents? I mean, there's another script. Uh, so what is your progress with the medieval abbreviations? I'm one of the proponents that's uh, going with the idea that uh, you should not expand abbreviations. So, so try to keep as close to Unicode as possible. And most of the Latin abbreviations you will be able to code in Unicode. And uh, for the German ones, there are some like ways around. So you basically have to um, not invent, but try nearest possible um, ways to, to work with them. You're free to... <laughs> well, I mean, like, you know, for me, as a person preparing editions, this would be like very uncomfortable to leave their like unexpanded abbreviation. So the way how I'm working is that I'm expanding yeah. them while transcribing. Yeah. So how do you approach this? Because you know, do you have any solution how to make it comfortable for your <laughs> for the editors? Yes and no. The problem with HDR is like the technology of HDR tries to, to match one to one the letters that are in the document and uh, that basically the input and the output should be one to one. And if we automatically have them expanded, this, this is working for, for in Konawa. I think last year we had a beautiful example of that. But in the end, we don't know why it is working and how good it is, basically, how good the quality is, uh, is going to be. So, there I'd say, even as an editor that provides expanded abbreviation, you can start from the, the abbreviated version and then have it expanded. I'm uh, leading a small edition project in Zurich where we are trying to do a very close transcription of, of what we are seeing. So, no expansion, no automatic expansion. But what you can do with, uh, with some small Python tools is that you can look for signs of abbreviation and then tag it automatically. So that works pretty nice. I can show you this in a very quick one. Thank you. Thank you, Arash. Okay, we have time for one more question. Um, I'm Mr. Kaiser from the National Archives of the Netherlands. I'm also working on the transcribers. I'm wondering how you uh, plan to present the results of transcriptions uh, on your website <coughs> to the public. Yeah, that's the problem we have <laughs> not been dealing with, but uh, for the moment it's uh, TEI XML exports. So the TEI XML export is, uh, is, is currently being improved and is, is very useful. And in the background we're also using the TXT files just to, to search through them, so throw them into indexes and stuff. So you're not planning on uh, implementing the keywords searching on your website, for example? Not directly. I mean, the keyword spotting itself is too slow to, tell, to use it uh, real time. So, for example, in, in this page, if you're searching through, uh, if you're doing a search here on 80 pages, this will take you 30 seconds. And there's no way that you can make people in the internet age wait for 30 seconds on a web page without giving them money or something. So this is why keyword spotting needs an indexing process in a second part, which is currently being implemented in, in Transcribe. So then it will be possible that you can use the REST API and directly use it. But uh, uh, as of today, it's, it's not possible, but it's going to be possible in the future. Okay, thank you. Okay, we'll leave it there. Thanks very much, Tobias. Um, our next speaker is um, Eva Lang. Eva also works on the Read project with us, um, and she's from the Diocesan Archives of um, Passau. So take it away, Eva. Thank you, Louise. Um, what we started off in the project is uh, having scans of around 800,000 images of register books. That means birth, death, and marriage records, which appear in a lot of archives because, well, you have data about people, right? Mm -hmm. And when we, uh, on the first run through the, through the images, what we found out, of course, uh, the handwriting develops from something in the 16th, 17th century, 
over more table style, hand drawn tables to printed forms in all different layouts. So what we, the first thing we did coming in from the archival perspective, by the way, I'm not an archivist, I'm a computer person. So uh, language uh, and communication is, well, I'll put it in a way, sometimes a bit challenging, but we worked our way through. So we scrutinized the data set and uh, came up with a subset focusing on the timing between 1847 and 1878. And we found out that there's some 26,500 images that fall into that time period. And this is basically the data set that we're working with. We have prepared ground truth and we use a, an archival approach to that. So we selected uh, scribes and uh, traced the scribes, the writers, according to uh, second level uh, literature we had. So we know which priest was working from, from which period of time. So everything, even from a historical perspective, is round here. The best results, the best figures that we can go on this uh, data set so far is 6.98% of character error rate, and this is really astonishing. We have not seen, unfortunately, this uh, completely tested on our data set, but this is still a work to be done. And this is, uh, again, thanks to the Rostock group that we're getting those results now. In the same time frame, of course, uh, and this would be the second level to, to test things, uh, but we have not worked our way through producing um, ground truth data here. It's the marriage records. There are a fewer numbers of images uh, and the baptism records with a lot more images. So basically, there's two sort of user requests that come to the archives here. And one is the big, big group of family historians who say, well, I cannot read the old handwriting yet. I want to know who my ancestors are. And well, if you do have the chances, I also want to learn as much as I can about them. So basically, what the, the disease, the illnesses that uh, they died from, where they lived, who they were engaged with, whatever is there in the record court. So for that, we're throwing in the technical term of information extraction. And uh, I put up a rough overview slide here again. Uh, Hervé, our colleague at uh, uh, Navalovs, will give you a further insight this afternoon. Uh, the main principle is we have, well, from the archival point of view, what you need is the images, is the transcription, so the more or less perfect the way you want it to be read <coughs> and all the layouting plus the, uh, the text, the recognition, the, what we call the processing, and what you get out in the end, it's basically XML records that you can work with. And in our case, it would be that entry. An example here, and uh, let me just quickly ask you, Shalfan, who can read the text? Who can read the 18th century or a 19th century uh, read handwriting? If you can just read that. <coughs> Thank you. Who is uh, familiar with uh, illnesses of that period? <laughs> <laughs> well, basically, why I'm asking is if you look at the, the record that we get out of there, it says, the automatic reading that we had, and this is dated around May, so it is incorrect here, but what I want to demonstrate is basically the output that we're working with. It should read correctly, uh, so that's a, a, um, a disease, uh, something like tuberculosis, uh, and uh, it was it could not be cured back then. So it was a deadly disease, and it appears in our records. Having that in the output, of course, it, it opens avenues to uh, any sort of historian researchers going into the history of medicine, going into the spread of diseases, going into uh, whatever combination you can find of location of uh, ages. So the use case is really terrific. Then we have the second batch of uh, researchers. 
being basically the scholarly researchers, and their interest is uh, something along those lines. I'm doing research on the involvement and spread of illnesses, on child death, the migration of families, the age of uh, living, and I always put in brackets here the between the time frame that we're focusing on. So here, the use case is mainly keyword spotting. And that is what, what Tobias showed earlier. So even if the transcription is not perfect in the sense that the calligraphy of people would call it, uh, you can still get good results. So again, the setting um, you might recognize that uh, is image and raw truth, and then you do the layout or the processing, the HDR, and you end up with a list of hits for a given keyword. So here the aim is not to get full record, but only those parts that are of interest to you. So the one of the, and that was uh, what, we, what, what we already talked about a bit in Tobias' presentation, one of the interfaces, one of the viewing the display things is, uh, of course, within Transcribus, if you want to uh, drill down from a user perspective into a or it just said that here, a rather complex uh, Java tool. But the beauty of that is that you get the results and the system tells you how much the, the hit that it presents to you is worth or, or how, what the quality of it is. So the numbers on the, on the right hand side, the highlighted, gives you the essential probability of the worth of, of the hit. There's several avenues in the project. So uh, the University in Valencia did a different thing, opens up full avenues. Uh, Liz will be talking, and Liz will be talking about that on the Bancom uh, demonstrator here. The, the web interface does have cap capabilities to bring that in and to allow you doing queries there as well. But, um, to, uh, to be as well, it's not an instant thing. As a uh, historian, scholarly <coughs> researcher, can wait for, for results. Although it's, well, you need to set up your query and you wait and come back the next day and you get the full bunch of things. So if you're not, if time is not an issue, it will serve you really, really well, even on March And that is scheduled to be part of the web interface and testing phase only. So I still want to show you some results and some comparison of what HDR Plus can do for us. Um, because we have done testing on either side. So the HDR is what is currently in the system available to those who have uh, been granted access. For our case, it produced around 70 to 20 percent of character error rate. That was training at uh, around May, June timeframe. And the first test results on a new HDR plus in the system is the around 7% that I already mentioned. Further tests are still to be taken. And these tests, these stats, go on to 1,200 pages of plan proof that we produced. So not the full data set yet, not the 20, uh, 26,000 pages, but that small subset. So the results are on stripes, on hands that have been trained. You can start with the default parameters in the training and you get the curve, like the very first things, the red curve here. If you continue training, so if you do the same looping again, wait for several hours, the results will improve. You might notice that there's several spikes in there. They should not be in there. It's uh, pages where some parts of the transcriptions were missing, uh, where some irregularities are happening. So uh, these are here for the investigation to be done. The second <coughs> statistics that I can show you is another uh, green curve. The red thing is what we saw on the slide before. The green thing, well, the spikes are even higher. There's a discussion still to be done with the HDR Plus experts. We have been uh, going through some of that. What we do believe is that because the system is trained differ differently, those are 
are real outliers and we need to really investigate on these three pages again. In general, the green line is below the red line. So there are a lot of improvements already possible, but still more to be done if you tune the parameters. Of course, the line is not uh, all the times below because the, the training process is different. So um, it's a black box thing for from a user perspective, and what the feeling we get though is the new system is a lot better. Well, with the exception of some of the outlines. So the last three slides that I want to show you are an evaluation set of 50 pages of stripes that are definitely not in the front group set we had before. And those nice sticky slides here is what the error rate comparison tool in Transcribus leaves you. So if you do compare the run truth version, run the HDR on top, you can get a per page statistic. <coughs> now the red and green have a little bit different meaning. The green is the word error rate, and the red thing is the character error rate. Here, again, this is the old train, the HDR, and what strikes is that you have on the left hand side a line running up, the axis is running up to 80%. So the columns are rather high. Well, the average character error rate that we get out of that is 23 point something percent. Now, if we do compare this with the HDR Plus system that I was able to train a couple of days ago, the number of character errors is dropping by 2%. This is still far from where we want to go, but it, it, it really shows that uh, improvement is possible. What you will notice on the slide title here as well, it says no dictionary. Now, this is an interesting uh, part that still needs further investigation. What we want to achieve is actually given dictionaries, like for, for the diseases, we do have a database uh, that a lot of them is recorded in. Like for the names, we know the names in, in our diocese. Just overlay that and we hope that the columns are dropping or diminishing as well. And as a last slide, this is if you apply a training dictionary, in fact, an interesting phenomenon comes out because a training dictionary means only the words the system learned in the training. They are not necessarily the words that you need to recognize in the data set itself. So here, if you pay close attention, the character error rate is up to 23% again. Now if we add a, the perfect dictionary, we do expect that to become lower. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is the end of what I can bring you from Passero. Very much either. Okay, we have time for maybe one or two questions. There's a microphone coming for you. Thank you. This is just a comment. I know that the, the city archives in Copenhagen uh, have been working with some uh, death certificates and they have been working also on various types of disease and trying to figure out you know, what kind of cannabis they were in. So perhaps you could uh, go to them and see whether they, they have anything useful. Some of the disease may be in Danish, of course. So it may not be helpful for you, but the Latin one might be you. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Any questions? <clears throat> I wondered if you're trying to apply natural language processing to any of the data that you generate, and if you have, uh, uh, particularly with dates, what sort of success have you got? Well, we have not gone into, uh, into those uh, experiments here, uh, but there's, of course, I think the the uh, applying different dictionaries per or dictionaries per column, especially uh, for for dates uh, and combining things, might improve. But uh, this is beyond the scope of the literature. Thank you. Okay, we better leave it there for the questions. So thanks very much, Eva, and I'll invite our next presenters to the stage. So next up, we have um, another couple of people who work on the Read Project. 
Um, it's Lauri Hivonen and Maria Cardio from the National Archives of Finland, um, and they're going to talk about their work together. So take it away. Thank you, Louise. I hope you can hear. Um, so, yes, my name is Maria Kalia and I work at the National Archives of Finland, where I'm responsible for the, the project. The National Archives is the biggest archive in Finland. We have over 200 kilometers of records. We also have quite a large digital archive with 76 million inches at the moment. The archives have 32,000 visits annually and over a million visits in our digital collections. Today, we're going to tell you about our project with the collection of renovated court records. It's one of the largest collections at the National Archives. The collection starts from 1623, when the Court of Appeal was established. So these renovated court records are basically transcribed records from lower courts who produce the records for the Court of Appeal. At the moment we have around 800,000 pages digitized from the collections, only so-called notification records, but rest of the 19th century and early 20th century collection will be digitized by Family Search during this and next year, so we will get around 5 million pages more of this. So, our aim in the degree project is to provide the court records in machine-readable form, in addition to the digital images. Um, to achieve this, we produce two sets of ground truth data, so that is text written out by specialists <coughs> or non specialists. The first batch was written last year by family researchers working as volunteers. Uh, they produced around 300 pages of ground truth. And with that, we produced a model for court records with a character error rate around 9% which is quite doable as the, and actually quite good as none of the ground truth producers were specialists in paleography or even at the court records. And with this kind of material we can achieve quite good readable text, at least for keyword searches and so forth. And this year we've ordered around 700 pages more of ground truth from a private company. And we use this to produce new models. Currently, we are in process of testing the new HDR Plus. And first results seem to indicate that we can get the character error rate below 3%, maybe around 2% even. For comparison's sake, the character error rate of the most common OCR software, a fine reader, with Finnish government records from 1990s is around 18,000, so we can get a lot better results with 18th century handwritten text than with 19th century, 20th century MS4 documents. And here's an example of our first HDL model. And this was produced by the family researchers and has an error rate around 12%. So this is a very early model. And the main problems were the that N, let us N and M are quite hard in the Swedish 19th century language. Also the numbers were hard. I'm sorry that these are all written in Swedish, but we're in a German speaking country, so I think you can try to understand some of those texts. But overall, this is quite a good result compared to the first one. The main problems are doubling of the letter N and wrong standard letters. Here's a comparison. This is a new model we just finished yesterday evening with the new ACR Plus. This is done with about 200 pages. And on the first thing, I think this is quite readable, might be around 5 to 8 person error rate. The main problems are the person names. For example, here there's something called Tolivis, which should be Fabias. <laughs> But the good thing is that the keyword spotting tool that the prior papers was spoken about does recognize the correct place name and gives 
is a 71% uh, accuracy for the correct spelling, so I think we could use the keyword spotting to search for proper names and use this model for the basic text. Um, so, about next year, um, about the future, and what we're doing with the court records. So, during 2019, we're processing the 800 pages of court records, with 800,000 pages of court records, with HDR, and then we're going to provide the recognized collections through our digital services. So, at the moment, we're building new uh, interface where we can show text and image and also we're building an interface where our customers can do the keyword spotting through our services. What well, next? Um, well, we're going to have 5 million pages more of this collection in digital form. So we're going to start a new project and we're hopefully Kind of process the five million pages in following years with uh, with cooperation with the read co op. But thanks for listening, and we're happy to answer your questions. Okay, thanks very much. So we have time for a few questions. Is it correct that I would just say that you're going to make a combination of the keyword spotting on your website and uh, full text search on your website? Well, basically we're building a frame where it looks like uh, our customers are using our services when they're actually using services from the Read Co-op from Crossfibers. But yes, so it's possible to do both kind of searches, yes. I'd like to add that uh, Keyword searching will be most likely done by indexing, so we are going to index the whole matter and yeah. provide instant keyword searches. So that will be uh, maybe faster than 30 seconds? Yeah, it's instant. It should be instant, so it yeah. depends on your internet connection. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions or comments? Thank you very much. Um, I've, I've heard, uh, I, I'm sort of a new person in this, in this area, so I've heard uh, the, uh, the, the term CER and WER, and um, you get one number for, for those scores. Um, have you looked into the actual subtypes of what actually causes the error rate to go up in your corpus? So you looked at letter combinations, for instance, you said double N uh, created a, a problem. So I could think of other combinations of letters that might be difficult for a, uh, for a program to, uh, to recognize. Yes, we are currently investigating the <coughs> script used during the 19th century. So T's and F's are hard, O's and A's are hard for letters. And typically numbers are also hard because they are usually separated. And usually the numbers and personal names cause the problems. The main reason for personal names are that we don't have all of the names in our ground truth material. Mm -hmm. So the program has to guess those. Yeah, especially with the court records, where there are tons of place names and names of states and farms, so they yeah. don't appear that often, certain names are. Well, would you agree that the, a combination of, say, statistically based transcription and some kind of script based uh, um, simplification of the, of the tra automatic transcription problem would be a way forward, where you look for patterns of faults or mistakes that you might be able to, uh, to solve by means of a rule, for instance, if you come into a, a, a possible uh, problem and you can base the solution of that problem on, on say, the likelihood of be, uh, there are a double N in, in your corpus, because you've already uh, uh, identified that. Would, would that help? Would, would you be able to reduce your, your, your character error rate or your word error rate in that fashion? 
Yes, I think that there might be a solution, but on the other hand, um, we are just an archive and we aim to produce the text as downloadable also for the customers and scholars so that they could do the <coughs> error correction there. And if we are going to do something like 5 million pages, I think we are fully <coughs> satisfied with error rate less than 5 <coughs> where the place names are a bit problematic, but we can try to use, for example, a dictionary for place names or and personal names and try to look if that would correct provide better let small error rate. Mm -hmm. uh, we are currently investigating about how we should do that model for the HDR. Thank you. And anyway it's ninety five percent more than we have right now. So really <laughs> have to... um, is there any other questions? Yeah. You just mentioned uh, place name gazetteers. The problem about uh, using uh, gazetteers of 19th century uh, uh, place names and personal names is that they're often written slightly differently uh, and there's no standardization. Then. Are you contemplating historical gazetteers or working together with, say, like institutions, institution for Eden Hemsky or something like that? I think that would be that. We could work with, for example, um, with the uh, Institute of uh, Languages of Finland. Um, on the other hand, I think we will skip the use of language dictionaries because studies with the modern OCR all finished tend to show that you shouldn't use the dictionary. And you get, well, a lot worse results for Finnish and also for Swedish when using dictionaries with OCR software. And I think the same way might be the case with HDR, but um, we don't have to investigate that. Thank you. Okay, we'll leave it there for the questions and move on to the next speaker, so thanks very much. Okay, um, I'll welcome the final speaker in the session to the stage. It's um, Mark Ponte from Amsterdam City um, Archives. I'm not going to present uh, the results that we have so far, I'm going to present a new tool, tool that we have developed. Uh, in the last couple of months. And this project is called in Dutch Crowd Leert Computer Lezen, which means Crowd teaches the computer how to read. So we want to use the crowd to uh, read historical documents. For this site, we use the Notarial Archives in Amsterdam. We have been working with this archive for a couple of years and some, some days, so they are three and a half kilometers long with 30,000 different entry numbers. At the moment, we have 6 million scans, which is roughly 30% of the archive. Um, and yeah, uh, we want to have them searchable completely, completely transcribed in a couple of years. And the material is from late 16th century until early 20th century, but we are focusing on the early modern period, uh, 16th, 17th, 18th century. In the last couple of years, we have been working with traditional indexing them, uh, names, locations, and we do this with a crowdsourcing tool called Vele Hande, which is developed uh, yeah, some years ago by a uh, private company, Picturai, and uh, a lot of archives in them use this because there's a lot, large crowd over there. And for now, we have been in indexing this. I'm just going to skip this. this is the, so, this is what the, the total amount of scans we have at the moment in the city archive, mm -hmm. almost 35 million. This is what we have done so far. So uh, we have a group of about 500 volunteers that uh, read the documents, say what kind of document is this, and then they mark where there are names and locations. And just a very small sum, some remarks what the deed is about. And then yeah, we just have a basic search engine now consisting of about 250,000 documents. So that's about uh, 1 million scans. And that's 5 to 10% of the archive. But of course, we want to do it with the complete archive. And we have been working two years now, and we only did 5 to 10%, so and we don't want to let it go on for 20 years or more. So we decided to speed things up uh, so we can, in 2025, the idea is to have the complete archive uh, search for. Whether this will be names or the full uh, transcriptions or a combination of both. Uh, 
we are will see that uh, depending on, on the technology, I think. And to do this, we decided to work also with HCR. And then, but the tools that are available now were not satisfying for us because we wanted to use the crowding. We have more than 500 volunteers actively working already on this archive and we want to keep them in the same environment. That's why we decided to uh, use the same Vela Handen, many hands. It means platform also to use HDR and transcript. This is just a little bit that we, what we have done so far is that we, there was a, a set of five notaries, 18th century transcribed uh, in Vietnam, just to see what, what's happening, what, what kind of models do we have. As you can see, the, the best models we have so far, so they're all based on one notary, are about a character error rate, uh, about between six and seven. Um, but actually what we want is uh, almost 100% transcriptions in our database. So the whole idea was to make two projects. In the first project on Pelan, we will make transcriptions by the crowd, uh, uh, starting with 15 notaries, the crowd indexes or, or transcribes 100, 200 uh, pages, and then we start making models. If the model is good, we can go to a second project where the same crowd gets the results, improve the transcriptions mm -hmm. until almost 100%. Just to see how this works, I want to go just on the live version of the website, which is soft live since this week, um, just to show why we use this. So we have all sorts of uh, interesting things for crowdsourcing. Uh, we have uh, uh, a credit system that every, every time that you uh, transcribe a document you get some credits and afterwards we organize all sorts of things and you can buy books with your credits and to keep the people uh, active. Um, they also really like the events coming together. These people start there, they're all working from home and once or three times a year, they all come together in the archive just to see you know, how things are going. So they, they become friends. Um, there is a forum where the people can ask questions, uh, technical or funny things they, they, they find in the archives. Uh, they can just, um, and as you can see, so we have been working only <coughs> one week and um, we have some results on, so uh, this is the document that are transcribed in the last week. Uh, if you see, uh, there are two notaries, uh, we have already more than 100 scans, so in a few weeks this, uh, this will be uh, uh, done by the crowd. So we can build our models. I'd like to show just a little bit, of course, what we did is actually uh, building the transcribers uh, 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 platform in uh, uh, Vela Handen, but with all the tools we have in Vela Handen. So uh, there are all sorts uh, of uh, possibilities. This scan is too hard for me to give it to somebody else, or there's something funny inside the scan, or uh, I want to see the next scan in the same uh, row of scans so I can read a little bit further, but I'm not just to know where this is about. Yeah, and so basically, basically people just start transcribing here and then a second person always gets to correct the result. So I can show you how the correction works. Mm. So if, if you are more a cloud user, you can be a volunteer or somebody that's working at the archive, um, you will get the same uh, uh, transcription, the same document, and you just uh, decide whether uh, the volunteer has correctly transcribe this, and then finally you can save it and you have uh, a document that's ready to use in the HDR model. And I think this is uh, a way, since we have all the volunteers there and you have the whole community approach also, that we, we will have some improvements in, in having a lot of, of, uh, of uh, transcriptions to start like building real big models for this 17th century model. Uh, uh, archives. So that's what I just want to show you. Any questions? Thank you, Mark. I've got a crowdsourcing project in London, so I was really happy to see that. So, have we got any questions in the audience? 
Uh, very impressive. Um, it looks like you're just at the beginning of testing the new system, and the example you've shown, I think, is of input to create a, a ground base. Um, have you tested with the users, uh, um, them receiving the HTR output, and them then editing it? I'm going to talk a little bit later about our own experience of that, and the users have found the system today quite frustrating, but not using the system. Well, that's what I actually, in the second project, we will have HCR uh, uh, made transcription. For now, we don't have that yet, but of course, you we'll have the, the, the second part within this project, which means that you check what other users have done. And that's working perfectly, so we can just see how that is good. And, okay, this, this fine and go on. Of course, it will depend on the character work average, whether this is satisfying or not. If you have like only 3 to 4% error, it would be fine for the crowd. If it's like large amounts, then it will be fr frustrating if you have to change everything. Thank you. Any other questions? How much is the current word error rate on your manual um, <laughs> transcriptions? So you have a two-stage yeah. um, transcriptions. Yeah. So how, how many words or character or whatever are corrected by the second stage? You have, you have on the left side, you have the, the, the first transcription mm -hmm. from some user, and on the right side, there is some so, correction. Yeah. Yeah. And the question is how many things are corrected over all documents? So we, uh, we started just this week. Uh, <laughs> so you can see here uh, um, uh, this doc. So this is uh, almost 100 percent. So almost a uh, little bit more than 100 documents, of which uh, 37 percent is corrected. If if we talk about uh, our project we're doing now, we did like with the crowd uh, 250,000 uh, leads, so almost 1 million uh, documents in two years. Yeah, but the question uh, yeah. would be how many errors have been corrected in this one. Oh video. yeah, I cannot, at the moment I cannot, cannot uh, This would be interesting to yeah, compare yeah. to automatic. Yeah, of course, yeah. But we have to wait for the... Uh, <coughs> Some volunteers more accurate than others as well. Of course. <laughs> okay, I think we better leave it there for the questions. Um, so thank you to Mark and all of our presenters. Thanks everyone.